Hi everyone, good day to you guys. So I'm Ma'am Sarah and this is Blood Vessels and Circulation. So it's prepared by Ma'am Takagi, PTR PPT. So I hope after this uh, lecture you will learn more and appreciate more about your blood vessel and the circulation circulatory system in general. Okay, so let's start. This is the references used and uh, a lot more which is also included in your student guide. So we have uh, five functions of our circulatory system. So the first one is it carries blood. So we know that the blood vessels, arteries and veins, they carry uh, blood from into the heart, right, to the body tissues. Um, exchange of nutrients, waste products and gases with tissues. So we know that there are nutrients needed in order for our cells to work, right? So uh, those nutrients, uh, like and also oxygen, they diffuse from the blood vessels to cells in all areas of the body, and also the waste products from your cells to the blood vessels so that they can be expelled or excreted. Third one is it uh, transport substances. So we have hormones, um, enzymes, nutrients, gases, waste products that, that should be transported again to all areas of the body. The next one is we'll be discussing also how uh, the circulatory system helps in regulating your blood pressure because it's not just the heart that works to maintain our blood pressure in homeostasis. Okay. Uh, number five, it directs blood flow to tissues. So we know that uh, without blood vessels, of course, our tissues won't uh, receive any blood flow. So later we'll be discussing also about the blood flow relationship with other factors. Okay, so let's move on to the structural features of your blood vessels. So we have three main types of blood vessels, the arteries, capillaries, and veins. So artery stands for A, carries blood A way away from the heart. So capillaries, on the other hand, is the most common blood vessel type. So this is where the exchange between the blood and interstitial spaces occurs in uh, across the walls of the capillaries. Okay. So it's also the thinnest of the blood vessels. That's why it's capable of uh, exchange. And then the, vein, the veins, which are uh, vessels that carry blood towards the heart, right? Like your uh, superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and yeah. And then these vessels, as uh, we'll show you later, they, they form a continuous passageway for blood flow from the heart through the body and then back to the heart. It's like it's a uh, looped. It's an, a never-ending loop. It goes back to the heart and into the body and back to the heart and into the body. Okay, so let's take, discuss one by one those types of blood vessels. Okay, so the first one is your capillaries. So they are classified into three. We have continuous capillary, fenestrated, and sinusoidal. So how they are deeper, how they, how they differ. So it is uh, based on their diameter and, of course, their uh, permeability characteristics. So continuous capillary, as you can see, there, there are no gaps in between the endothelial cells. Okay, no fenestrae or the window, so meaning they are less permeable to large molecules. So we can see them more commonly in the muscle, nervous, and connective tissue. On the other hand, the letter B, as you can see there, um, okay, B fenestrated capillary, as you can see, they have windows 7 to 100 nanometer in diameter and also covered by your diaphragm. So this one, diaphragm, and um, these capillaries are highly permeable, so they could be seen in intestinal villi, uh, ciliary processes of the eyes, choroid plexus of the CNS, and glomeruli of the kidneys. So in fenestrated capillary, we can see that there are fenestrae or windows without a diaphragm, okay? So with and without diaphragm. Uh, letter C is your sinusoidal capillary. So as you can see here, the fenestrae is larger compared to your fenestrated capillary. That's because um, they ha they need to uh, to let larger molecules to pass across the walls. Like for example, in in our bone marrow, in the liver, in the spleen, and lymphatic organs. Okay, so those are the three different types of your capillaries: continuous, fenestrated, and sinusoidal. So what you can see here is a, a capillary network. Okay, capillary network. So it is made from an arteriole. Okay, so it is from an, an arteriole to the metarterioles and then through the capillary network which is this one and then the venules okay and then as we can see there, there are smooth muscle cells that we can see which is your uh, precapillary sphincter so those sphincters in the terms itself uh, it, they, they regulate blood flow through the capillaries so if they um 
constrict, okay, they constrict, we know that there will be decrease in blood flow. And then if they dilate, okay, th there will be increase in bl blood flow if dilation. So same for the blood vessels, okay? So uh, this is your capillary. Let's go now to the structure of your arteries and veins. So uh, this is the structure of the artery and vein. So it consists of, as you can see, tunica intima, externa, and media, a basement membrane. So tunica intima actually is composed of a, a delicate connective tissue basement membrane. Okay, so that's called your lamina propria. And it also has a penetrated uh, layer of elastic fibers called the internal elastic membrane. So internal elastic membrane. And also your lamina propria. Okay, that's your, um, that's the, uh, that's the parts of your tunica intima. On the other hand, your tunica media uh, being in the middle. So as you can see, it's composed of smooth muscle cell and they are arranged circularly around the blood vessels okay so this tunica media is important because it regulates the blood flow through contraction and relaxation since it's a, smo a smooth muscle okay smooth muscle okay let's go to your tunica adventitia or tunica interna or aka ad tunica adventitia okay so it's composed of connective tissue it varies from dense to loose connective tissue so it merges with the connective tissue surrounding the blood vessels. Okay, so this is the outermost layer. Outermost layer. Okay, so let's go now to your arteries. So arteries, we have different types. Okay, we have elastic arteries. We also have muscular arteries. We also have medium. Oh, okay, so that's it. And then we will also discuss it, the medium and the large veins. Okay, so let's discuss how they differ. So elastic arteries, uh, they recoil when they are stretched. So it prevents blood pressure from falling rapidly. Okay, so when you are, when the blood vessel are, when the artery uh, are stretched, then it recoils back. Okay, so preventing a, a blood pressure drop. Tunica intima is relatively deep. I mean, thick. Okay, as you can see, it's thick. The tunica intima is thick. Okay, this one until this one. Okay, and then the tunica media is mostly um, elastic connective tissue. So, yeah, elastic connective tissue. And your tunica adventitia is relatively thin. So, basically, the most important layer in here is your tunica media, which is uh, composed of elastic connective tissue, right? So let's go now to the muscular artery. So as you can see here, the muscular arteries, the tunica intima, is uh, has a well-developed internal elastic membrane, as you can see here in the like blue grayish blue color, and then um, the tunica media is a smooth muscle layer. Okay, this one is a smooth muscle layer. Let's go now your, to your tunica adventitia. As you can see, it's composed of thick layer it's thicker now compared to the elastic artery a while ago so thicker layer of collagenous connective tissue okay so that's all for your uh, muscular uh, arteries okay let's go now okay so um we have also um medium and large veins so in medium and large vein these three tunics are also present so in uh, medium and large veins the tunica media is thin Okay, so that's what you should remember. Although it's thin, it can regulate the diameter of the vessel because the blood pressure in the venous system is low. So even if it's thin, it's okay. It can regulate the uh, vessel diameter if it if it wants to vasoconstrict or vasodilate. Okay, but the most predominant layer or the thicker layer is the tunica adventitia in your medium and large veins. Okay, so speaking of the medium and large veins, these are uh, some of the types of your veins okay we have the venules so the venules they collect blood from the capillaries so they are the smallest or nearest to the capillaries and then they transport it to the small okay transport it to the small veins okay so nutrient exchange occurs across the venule walls but as the walls of the small veins increase in thickness the degree of the nutrient exchange decreases so venules it's where the again nutrient exchange happens exchange happens and then the medium veins as you can see they collect blood from your small veins 
to the large veins. And then the large veins, as we can see, they transport blood from the medium veins to the heart, okay? So that is like the flow of the blood from your capillary to, ve to, ve to vein or venous system and then to the heart. So we also have a portal vein. Okay, portal veins begin in a primary capillary network and then extend some distance and then in a secondary capillary network. So it's like that. <clears throat> So there are two like uh, two capillary networks. So what's, uh, what's um, genuine here on your portal veins is there is no pumping mechanism like uh, the heart between two capillary networks. Okay. So uh, an example is your hepatic portal vein. So they carry blood from uh, the capillaries in your GI tract and spleen to the dilated capillaries called your sinusoids in the liver. That's why it's hepatic portal vein. So from GI tract to spleen, and spleen capillaries to the sinusoids of your liver, okay? Okay, on the other hand, the hypothalamo hypofacial portal veins. Okay, so they carry blood from the hypothalamus, uh, hypothalamus to the uh, anterior pituitary gland. Okay, so they carry blood from hypothalamus to the anterior pituitary gland. So valves, you know, the heart has valves right also your veins has valves so they allow blood flow blood to flow towards the heart but not in the opposite directions or like your uh, svc ivc they have uh, valves so that there will be no uh, backflow of blood okay so let's now go to the two sets of blood vessels or circulation that we have so first is we have your pulmonary circulation so pul pulmonary circulation is uh, the system of blood vessels that carries blood from the right ventricle of the heart to the lungs and back to the left uh, atrium of the heart. So the heart pumps blood from the right ventricle, right? So from the, this is the heart and then from the uh, right ventricle to your pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries and then lungs. Okay, lungs and then it goes back to the heart to your uh, left ventricle or a uh, left atria rather okay so uh, meaning it's just um the circulation it's between the heart and the lungs okay so of course within the lungs that's where the gas exchange occurs so uh when when the blood returns from the lungs to your uh, left atrium then uh, via your pulmonary veins then you know it's already oxygenated blood Okay, so that's your pulmonary circulation again from the heart, right ventricle to the pulmonary trunk, pulmonary arteries, your lungs, back to the pulmonary veins as uh, oxygenated blood, it goes back to the left atrium. Okay, let's go next. Your systemic circulation, on the other hand, is um, it is the system of vessels that carries blood from the left ventricle to the aorta to the body. Okay, and then from the body back to the right atrium which is now it's deoxygenated blood okay so basically that's your systemic circulation from the heart to the body from the body back to the heart so here is a picture that represents that okay so let me just remove my inks okay as you can see here uh, from your it is your right atrium, right ventricle, it goes to the pulmonary trunk, arteries, lungs, back to the veins, and then back to the left atrium. On the other hand, this is your uh, systemic circulation. So, again, from the uh, left ventricle, so let's see, left ventricle to the aorta, to the body, okay, and then from the body back to the heart via your uh, veins through your right atrium. Okay, so this is your systemic circuit and this is your pulmonary circuit on the top. Okay. Okay, so let's go to the major arteries of the head and thorax. So you just have to review this one. I don't, uh, I don't need to um, mention it one by one. Okay, so it's just the flow of the blood right to the body. Of course, from our um, from our heart. So this is our heart. I already and then the branches, okay? So this is the arteries of the shoulder and upper limb. Okay, brachial artery, arm, axillary arteries, of paper artery, okay? Um, uh, major arteries of the abdomen and your pelvis, okay? From the abdominal aorta, and then these are 
the, the branches and the major arteries of the lower limb, as you can see now, okay, from your external iliac artery. And then major veins, okay, so superior vena cava to the heart and the vena cava, so from where, so these are the body parts that they drained, okay, and then they drained all to your uh, great veins, sorry. And then these are the major veins of the shoulder and upper limb, major veins that of your abdomen and pelvis, uh, major veins that drain the lower limb. As you can see, it's the same, but same name, external, but it's the vein already. So yes, let's go now to the nervous regulation of blood vessels. So as we can see here, there is a sympathetic vasomotor fibers. So this one is your sympathetic vasomotor fibers. So they innervate all the blood vessels of the body, okay, except your capillaries, your precapillary sphincter, and most metatarials. But they um they innervate your veins, your uh, arteries, okay. So innervation of these arteries and arterioles it allow the sympathetic nervous system to increase or decrease the resistance to blood flow, okay. So here an area of the lower bones. Okay, and upper medulla here, lower pons and upper medulla oblongata is called your vasomotor center. Okay, so it is tonically active. Meaning of tonically active, there is a low frequency of action potential that is transmitted continually through the sympathetic vasoconstrictor fiber. So it still sends some uh, action potential but not so uh, great fre frequency. Okay, so meaning even at rest, it produces that um, tone okay so as a consequence the peripheral blood vessels are partially constricted okay so that is your vasomotor tone so that is because again of your vasomotor center um, vasomotor center producing a low frequency of action potentials to your sympathetic nerve fibers again making your blood vessels partially constricted a term called vasomotor tone Okay, so not just only an excitatory part, but our vasomotor center has an inhibitory part as well. Okay, so it includes, of course, it inhibits and inhibits vasoconstriction. It now induces vasodilation. Okay, so areas throughout the pons, the midbrain, the diencephalon can either stimulate or inhibit the vasomotor center. Okay, so for example, uh, there is increased body temperature, so it's very hot in the Philippines. So what you will what will happen in our body. So the hypothalamus will detect that increased body um, temperature. So your hypothalamus will inhibit your uh, vasomotor center. So this one inhibitory part. Okay. So your hypothalamus, again, it will inhibit your vasomotor center. So it's like negative. Okay. Inhibit. That's why it will stimulate the inhibitory part. So what will happen? The one that will vasodilate are the blood vessels in the skin, okay? So if the blood vessels in the skin will vasodilate, they will open up, meaning the, there are more warm blood that will flow from deeper structures in our body to the skin. So that's why it will um, generate more heat loss in that manner, okay? So that's just it. Okay, so let's go to the basic principles of the circulatory function. So it will be discussing uh, many laws and principles, okay? So these are the main uh, principles. So blood flow to most tissues is controlled according to the tissue need. Okay, so for example, when the tissue is active when you are exercising the legs, for example, like so the muscles in there are, in, they uh, need increased supply of nutrients, right? And therefore, they, increase, they need increased blood flow than when you are just um, laying down in the couch, <laughs> okay? So it's as much as 20 to 30 times that there will be an increased demand of, of nutrients compared to the, to the resting levels, okay, 20 to 30 times more. So your heart can normally uh, increase the cardiac output more than uh, four to seven times greater than the resting levels, okay? So just that, just that range, four to seven times greater. So your heart cannot um, increase more than that. Therefore, the microvessels of each tissue continuously monitor tissue needs, okay? So they will be the one that will detect that if there's um, decreased oxygen, 
or nutrients or uh, more nutrients are needed or there are more waste products so uh, they will act directly on the local blood vessels so uh, it's um it will it will depend whether um it will be dilation or constriction that will be the result okay depending on the need of or the stimulus that there is okay so that is for number one for number two cardiac output is the sum of all the local tissue flows okay so we know that when blood flows through a tissue it immediately returns uh, via the vein right to the heart so the heart responds automatically to this increase in flow of blood by pumping it immediately back into the arteries so if your heart receives more blood from the veins then it will pump more blood via the aorta to the body okay so thus your cardiac output so later we'll be discuss what cardiac output is so next one is arterial pressure regulation is generally independent of either local blood flow control or cardiac output control so what does it mean so the circulatory system is provided with an extensive system for controlling the arterial blood pressure for example a fall of significantly below the normal level of about 100 mmHg on the arterial pressure, for example, it drops to 90 or 80. So within seconds, a barrage of nervous reflexes elicits a series of circulatory changes to raise the pressure back towards the normal. So later we will be discussing about what mechanisms regulates our blood pressure, okay? Okay, so let's go now to your blood flow. So blood flow is the quantity of blood that passes a given point in the circulation in a given period of time. Okay, it's like gano kadami yung blood na dumadaan dun sa particular area at particular time. Parang I'm, I'm at the right place at the right time. Parang ganon. So, yung rate or yung bilis ng blood flow to the entire circulatory system is equal to the rate of blood pumping by the heart. So, if there is increased rate, or pumping of the heart, there will increase a rate also of blood flow to the body. Okay, so the overall blood flow in the total circulation of an adult person at rest is called your cardiac output. So cardiac output, the unit is ml per minute. So meaning it is the amount of blood pumped into the aorta per minute. So that's why it's ml. So amount by ml per minute. Okay, so always remember that your blood always flows from an area of higher pressure to an area of lower pressure okay so therefore the greater the pressure difference the greater the rate of blood flow okay again the greater the pressure difference the greater the rate of flow okay so let's answer this one based on your knowledge regarding the flow of blood as we have discussed earlier what will happen if the heart stop on contracting okay so we mentioned that um, if the heart should stop contracting, the pressure in the aorta would become equal to that in the right atrium. Okay, so meaning um, there's no pressure difference, right? Because they just have equal uh, pressure in aorta and also your right atrium. So if there's no contraction, there's no change in pressure between those um, heart chambers, okay, and even with the great vessel of um example your aorta then there will be no blood flow because there will be no uh, force that will push the blood to flow from one place to another right so that is uh, just an application to the relationship of your uh, blood flow and also blood contraction and the rate of heart um, pumping okay so let's go now what is the in interrelationship between or among pressure flow and resistance okay so again, we said that the blood flow through a blood vessel via two factors, like pressure difference of the blood between the two ends, as I've mentioned kanina. So that's your pressure gradient along the vessel. So that's, that's the thing that pushes the blood through the vessel. So there must be a difference between point A to point B so that your blood can go from here to there, okay, from this end to um, another end. The next one is the impediment to blood flow. So that's uh, your vascular resistance. Okay. So the, the resistance occur as the result of friction between the flowing blood and the uh, inner wall or intravascular endothelium of the blood vessel. Right? There are cells in, inside, the, inside the wall of the blood vessel. So your blood creates friction in there. So yeah, creating a vascular resistance. 
Okay, so just note that it is the difference in pressure between the two ends of the vessel, not the absolute pressure in the vessel, okay, that determines the rate of flow. Again, increase pressure difference, increase flow. So for example, if the pressure at both ends of a vessel, so for example, this is your vessel, and then the pressure here is 100, okay, and it's the same here, 100 as well. Okay, so of course, we know that there's no pressure gradient, no, no difference. So there will be no flow, right? Okay, so let's move on to different laws. The first law is your Ohm's law. So Ohm's law is this. It means that the blood flow is equal to the pressure difference okay, over the resistance. So that's just the formula how you will get this. Okay, so let's go with uh, differentiating your laminar flow versus your turbulent flow, okay? So laminar flow, uh, this the blood flows at a steady rate. So it's this, it's just like straight, okay? Okay, a long, through a long, smooth blood vessel. So each layer of blood remaining the same distance from the vessel wall. Okay, okay, that's what I've said, remaining the same distance. Okay, same distance, so this one, same distance <clears throat> from the vessel wall, okay? And the central most portion of the blood vessel stays in the center of the vessel. Okay, so what is a parabolic velocity profile? So when the laminar flow occurs, the velocity of flow in the center of vessel is far greater than that towards the outer edges. So again, parabolic velocity means that the center part, wait, I'm going to just remove all ink. So the center part has greater velocity, okay, than compared to your edges, this part on the sides. So the fluid molecules touching the wall move slowly because, again, there, there is adherence in the uh, vessel wall. So the next layer next to that uh, slips over, okay? And the third layer over the second, and the fourth layer slips over the third, and so forth. So therefore, the fluid in the middle of the vessel can move rapidly, okay? Because many layers of slipping molecules exist between the middle of the vessel and the vessel wall. So parang when you are running, uh, kunyari marami kayong katabi, no? Tapos may, ano, may harang sa gilid. Siyempre, mas mauunay yung nasa gitna kasi nag-create uh, nga ng friction yung nasa gilid na part. So, uh, thus, each layer towards the center flows progressively more rapidly. Okay? So, yun lang yun. Far greater velocity, far greater or faster. Rapid. More rapidly. Okay? Than the outer layers. Yung nasa center. So, that's just what's important in your laminar flow. <clears throat> okay, let's go now to your turbulent flow. So in your turbulent flow, as you can see there, okay, okay, so uh, blood flows, as you can see there, the blood flows in uh, all direction, okay, and it's uh, continually mixing within the vessels. So flow may become uh, turbulent when the rate of blood flow is too great, okay, so sobrang lakas na daw ng, ng or sobrang bilis na ng blood flow kapag may sharp turn, Okay, yung mga blood vessels at may sharp turn. Or kapag may rough surface. Okay, so that's where, that's when your uh, turbulent flow happens. So this uh, turbulent flow, it form your eddy current. Okay, so your eddy current when present, the blood flows with much greater streamline because uh, eddies add to the overall friction okay, of the flow in the vessel. Okay, so again, blood flows with much greater resistance. So if there is a greater resistance, we know that the blood flow is uh, decreased, right? Because there is increased resistance or friction. Okay. Uh, so turbulent flow in abnormally constricted air arteries may indicate an increased probability that uh, thrombosis will develop. So if it happens, your turbulent uh, flow will happen on a constricted arteries, then you can assume that there will be a possibility that there will be thrombosis. Okay. Okay, so um, tendency of the tubular, tubular flow. 
Okay. <clears throat> so directly proportional of uh, increased tubular flow, of course, if there is increased velocity of blood flow, so mas mabilis, mas yung flow mas mabilis. Diameter, kapag greater diameter, then mabilis rin yung flow. Density of blood, okay, hindi siya masyadong uh, viscous, no? So, mabilis rin yung flow. Okay. So, um, when present now, blood flows with much greater resistance than when the flow is streamlined. Ah, okay, so I think it's just... Okay, so this is it's just the summary. So inversely proportional, so meaning um, the tubular flow will be decreased if there is more viscosity of the blood. Here is more density than increased tubular flow. Okay, so those are the difference differences between your laminar flow and turbulent flow. Okay, so let's go now to the measuring of systolic and diastolic pressure. So we have what we call your auscultatory method. So meaning you will use a um, sphygmo manometer and also stethoscope. Okay, just like that. Why? So crop cuff sounds, uh, they are caused mainly by blood jetting through the partially occluded vessels. Okay, and vibration of the vessel. That's why when you um, use your stethoscope, you will hear, okay, when you start to release the gauge so jet causes turbulence in the vessels beyond the cuff resulting to vibration heard through the stats that's it okay so um if you pump the blood pressure cuff so that it is at a higher pressure than the systolic pressure so for example i'm 120 and then you will pump the cuff into 140 so it should be higher than the systolic pressure so the artery will be completely flattened okay flattened all the time so there will be no flow you cannot hear any turbulent flow in that when you are getting the vital signs okay so if you start to reduce the pressure okay your your artery will start to open up okay but Still, it's a bit flattened, so there will be turbulence and you'll hear the sound, okay? So when you drop the pressure in the cuff below the diastolic pressure, then the pressure in the arteries will be higher than in the cuff. So even during relaxation. So even the lowest pressure in the arteries is still high enough to keep the artery from being flattened at all. So if the artery can't be flattened, there won't be any turbulence, so the sounds disappear again. Okay, so the first one again is when you open, so they are partially uh, flattened, so you will hear a turbulence, okay? And then the next one is um, the artery is not flattened anymore, so it's open, so you will, uh, the second sound will now disappear, or there will be no sound anymore after the uh, second final sound, okay? Okay, so this is how it's done in the clinic. So the pressure in the cuff is elevated above um, arterial systolic pressure. So for example, you'll ask your patient what is the normal blood pressure. So for example, she will say 120 over 80. Then you will um, inflate the cuff more than 120. So for example, 140, right? And then if the cuff pressure is higher than the systolic pressure, which is 120, then you will have no sound. You will hear no sound anymore because the uh, arteries are now blocked okay they are blocked the second one is the pressure of the calf is gradually reduced so this is when you are already deflating the calf okay you are now opening also the blood vessels but partially so you can see here partially open so pressure in the calf falls below the systolic pressure so also the pressure decreases so blood will begin to flow okay you can also hear the first carotid cough sound that is your systolic pressure 120 Next one is, as you continue reducing the pressure, you will hear the last carotid cuff sound, and that is your diastolic pressure, okay? The last uh, sound that you heard. So that happens because uh, there, there are no more sounds afterwards because the artery is no longer squeezed. So uh, there will be no reason, you know, to cause the jetting of the blood. Unlike when it is partially open here in, in part two, so you can hear the sound because it's just partially open okay let's now go to the resistance to blood flow as you can see resistance means impediment so resistance impediment so it must be calculated from the measurements of a uh, blood flow and the pressure difference between the blood vessels so the formula would be uh, derived from your ohm's law okay so uh, for example if the pressure difference between two points so pressure difference between two points is one 
um, MMHG, okay, one MMHG, and then the flow or the cardiac output or flow would be also one ml per minute. Okay, that's one over one. So we know that the resistance is one, right? So that is your called your peripheral resistance unit. So that is the unit, peripheral resistance unit. Okay, so let's now go to the two resistance. We have your total peripheral vascular resistance and total pulmonary vascular resistance. So here, the rate of blood flow, so blood flow is equals your cardiac output. The cardiac output average would be 100 mmHg. Okay, so therefore, if there is a pressure difference of 100 also in between your arteries and veins, so that's 100 mL. Sorry, this is the unit for mmHg for the pressure difference and then for the cardiac output, mL per minute. Okay, so again, that's um, the result will be 1 PRU. 100 over 100, so that's your resistance. So uh, on, the, on the other hand, the total pulmonary vascular resistance, it, it is between your mean pulmonary arterial pressure. So we know that the pulmonary arteries, they also have a pressure, so the average is 16 mmHg. And the left arterial pressure also has pressure, which is our average to 2. Okay, So the difference would be 14, and then again, the blood flow is 100. Uh, ml per minute. So the PRU would be 0.14. Okay, so hmm. the constricted blood vessels, okay, it will increase your TPR, okay, TPR increases. So if the blood vessels are dilated like this, we know that the resistance decreases, but if it's constricted, resistance increases, okay. So in conditions in which all blood vessels throughout the body become um, strongly constricted, the TPR occasionally rises until uh, 4 PRU. And then if it's uh, dilated, the resistance can fall to as little as 0.2 PRU. Or again, peripheral resistance unit. Okay, let's move on now to your conductance of blood. So, sorry, as the resistance increases, the blood flow decreases. Because if you have a resist, you cannot flow easily or the blood cannot flow easily. Okay, so let's go to the conductance of blood. So conductance means it's uh, the measure of blood flow through a vessel for a given pressure difference. So ito daw yung blood flow given nung pressure difference. So it is the exact reciprocal of resistance. So si ba kanina si resistance equals um, pressure changes over blood flow. Ito naman sabi sa kanya, measure of blood flow through a given difference. Diba? Tama. So it's like a reciprocal. So, hmm. Conduction of the vessel increases in proportion to diameter. So, kapag greater ang diameter, increase yung resistance. So, parang magkaiba nga sila ni, um, I mean, sorry, increase ang conductance. Parang magkaiba sila ni resistance. Kasi ba si resistance, the greater the diameter, the decrease the resistance, tapos si conductance, increase naman siya ngayon. Okay? So, ano sila inversely proportional. So, um, Small changes in uh, vessel diameter markedly change in its conductance. Okay? So when blood flow is streamlined or uh, laminar flow. So we can explain that again. Okay, let's uh, explain the picture first. So first picture, it demonstrates the effect of vessel diameter on blood flow. We know that if uh, the diameter is increased, the four here, there is also increase in blood flow, 256 from just one, okay? okay. So, letter B, these are concentric rings of blood flowing at different velocities. So, the farther away from the vessel wall, this one, is the fastest, right? The fastest the flow. But if you are near the vessel wall, wall like this one, so you know that there is a slower uh, velocity, okay? So, um, slight changes again in the diameter of a vessel causes tremendous changes in the vessel's ability to conduct blood when the blood flow is streamlined. So, parang straight lang daw streamlined, diba yung laminar flow, yung pag lang siya. So, meaning kahit 3 lang yung na, na, ano niya, na increase niya from your first um, vessel, sobrang laki ng difference. Okay? So, even if same yung pressure, as you can see here, no 100 mmHg lang, pero makita niya may difference talaga ng blood flow. No? Like, fourfold nga. 
uh, I mean, hindi lang pala fourfold. Fourfold ang increase ng ating ano, diameter. Pero ang increase ng ating blood was like 256 yung yung fold increase niya, no? Okay. So, we have a Poise's law. Poise's law. Okay. So, it just said that a small change in the diameter of a vessel. So, diameter in diameter. Um, dramatically changes the resistance. Okay. So, change in diameter resistance. And therefore, the amount of blood that flows through it. So, if there is vasoconstriction, so, di ba liliit yung diameter? So, ano mangyari? Increase ba or decrease yung resistance? Huh? Of course, there will be, okay, nagpiplay pa siya, no? There will be increased resistance to blood flow. Okay? And then, if it's uh, vasodilated naman, kabalik na lang, okay? So, increased resistance, decreased blood flow. Kapag vasodilated naman, we know na uh, increase yung diameter, so malaki siya. That's why yung, uh, okay, yung resistance niya is decrease. That's why yung konti lang nagre-resist. So, maraming magpa-flow na blood. No? Hindi siya mahirapan. So, yun lang naman yung Poise's Law. Poise's Law. So, what will be the explanation for this? Yung Poise's Law. So, again, balik tayo dun sa parabolic velocity profile during the laminar flow. Diba? Ganun yung, ganun yung ano niya. Yung uh, velocity niya. Mas mabilis yung nasa center. Okay? Dahil ito nga ang mga nasa ano, near the endothelial wall is parang may adherence na sila. Okay? So, during exercise guys, yung puwasis luman, ano natin siya, ma-apply natin, no? heart rate and stroke volume increase. No? Siyempre, may bilis tibok ng puso mo. Ang dami yung pump ng heart mo kasi nga, kailangan ng ano body mo. So, yung blood pressure in the aorta will also increase. So, in addition, yung blood vessels sa skeletal muscle mo, kunyari, nag-exercise ka ng biceps, no? mag increase or magpapasodilate yan kasi dapat, okay, maraming blood flow dyan. So, yun. Doon natin siya ma-increase in diameter, magdadilate. So, decrease resistance more blood flow to the part that you are using. Okay, punta naman tayo sa isa pang law, your, your Laplace law. So, Laplace law. Okay, so, there is uh, what you call your critical closing pressure. So, ano ba yung critical closing pressure? Ito yung pressure below which the vessel collapses and blood flow through the vessel stops. Okay? So, kapag ka na-reach na niya yan, magkocollapse na yung vessel mo. Okay, so wala nang magpa-flow na blood. So, um, yan, di ba nangyayari siya pag, for example, ano, when a person is in shock, so di ba, yung blood pressure will decrease below the, the critical closing pressure. So, kapag ganun, wala nang pressure, nagko-collapse na yung blood vessels mo. Wala na rin blood flow. Okay, decrease pressure, decrease blood flow, collapse. So, yung mga tissues na sinusupplyan niya ng blood vessel na yan, of course, mamamatay sila, no? Magiging necrotic sila. Okay? So, let's go here. Um, the force that stretches the vascular wall is proportional to the diameter of the vessel times the blood pressure. Okay? Diameter times the blood pressure. Mm. Uh, so, it just means that as the pressure, okay, yung pressure daw sa vessel nagdi-decrease, so, hindi masyadong nasa stretch yung vessel wall. Okay? So, Again, the force na nag-stretch sa ating vascular wall is proportional to the diameter of the vessel times the blood pressure. Okay? So, kapag ka yung pressure, sa vessel nag-decrease yung pressure, alam mo na decrease rin yung force na magsa-stretch. So, decrease stretch din. Decrease force of stretch. <clears throat> Okay, so some, there is uh, some minimum force that is required to keep the vessel open. So, yun nga naman, di ba? Kapag hindi naka-open nga, ay walang force na nagsa-stretch mo, lamang mako-close yung wall mo, yung blood vessel wall mo. Okay, so, ayan, kapag uh, nag-decrease pa yun ng sobra doon sa minimum na requirement na force, so ang mangyari nyo magsasara na siya, Okay. So, kapag naman in-increase mo yung pressure, o balik tarin mo naman siya, o increase pressure, O, oh, increase pressure, syempre, alam mo na magkakaroon na rin ng increase ng stretch. So, bubukas naman niya yun ng ating uh, blood vessel wall. Okay? So, yun lang naman yun. So, decrease pressure in a vessel, yun lang din sinabi ni ma'am. 
decrease force that stretches the vessel wall. Pag increase yung pressure, increase rin yung force na magsa-stretch, so mag-open. Okay, so some minimum force is required to keep the vessel open. So, yeah, pressure decreases, vessel closes na siya. Okay, so kailangan niyo ba si Richard? So he does not know it, but he has an aneurysm. So it's a part of an arterial wall that becomes weakened and bulges at the base of his left MCA. So explain why this is fatal. Why? So, um, i-relate natin si Laplace Law, no? Si Laplace Law kasi, again, kapag nag-increase yung diameter, okay, yung force applied to the vessel will also increase, eh? so even if the pressure remains constant. So, for example, okay naman yung BP niya, no? Pero, alam mo na, yung diameter ng vessel is increased. So, um, normal BP, pero increase yung diameter. Okay, so ano ba nangyayari again sa ating, ano, sa ating uh, aneurysm? Again, merong um, weakened or bulge na arterial wall. So, kumaga malapad, malapad na yung wall mo. So, yung force, again, yung force na ina-apply mo doon sa mahinang part, for example, ito yun, yung mahinang part, yun, yung siya, um, is greater than at other points along the blood vessel. So, since greater daw yung, ano niya, yung diameter niya, yung force, yung puwersa, mas greater dyan sa part na yan. Okay? Parang ganun yung ano, yung um, simple explanation. So, the greater kasi yung diameter mo, greater rin yung force na marireceive mo. So, what will happen is the weakened vessel will bulge even more. So, kapag sobra-sobra na yung pressure, no, kaya rin, umubo ka lang, konti, no, magre-rupture na siya. Pwede siyang mag-rupture, mag-lead na siya sa stroke, no, hemorrhagic stroke. And, of course, hindi natin gusto yun kasi syempre, mapapunta yung blood sa ating brain. No, sa ano, sa hindi naman dapat puntahan, no, sa labas na ng blood vessel. Okay? So, it is often fatal because of that. So, di ba naalala nyo si uh, Isabel Granada? So, that's what happened to her, no? Aneurysm. There are weak part of your blood vessels and then if it's already increased in diameter, then um, you know that it will also receive greater force, no? As mentioned by your Laplace law. Okay, so let's move on to your vascular distensibility. So, vascular distensibility in your arteries, it allows to accommodate the pulsatile output of the heart and to average out the pressure pulsation, okay, resulting to smooth, continuous flow of blood through the very small blood vessels of the tissues. Okay, so distensibility means extended. Diba? Kaya niyang ma-distend, ma-extend. So again, it is related sa elastic properties ng iyong um, arterial wall. Diba? Kanina minensyon natin yung mga tunica media, tunica, siya, tunica intima. So diba, meron tayong different types also of arteries. So yeah. So know that one valuable characteristic of the vascular system is all blood vessels are distensible, no? All DVs, all blood vessels are distensible. <clears throat> so, it allows them, again, to accommodate yung mga pulsatile output of the heart. No? So, the most distensible by far of all the vessels are your veins, no? So, even slight increase in venous pressure, kaya nag-increase lang ng venous pressure. So, yung veins mo, magsa-store na siya ng extra 0.5. 1 liter of extra blood. Ganun siya ka-distensible. No? So, your veins are more, much more distensible than your arteries. So, kasi yung walls ng arteries natin, ano siya mas makapal? I mean, they are stronger and thicker. So, yung veins naman, uh, they are uh, eight, 8 times more distensible than the arteries. No? So, that is a given increase in pressure causes about 8 times as much, 8 times as much increase in blood in a vein as in an artery of comparable size. So, kapag nag-increase yung pressure, si artery, for example, nag-increase lang ng uh, 1 liter or 0.5 liter. Tapos si, si vein mo, ito times 8 mo yun, no Kaya tinatawag yung ating veins na um, reservoir. No? So, nag-store sila ng large quantities ng extra blood na kapag kailangan ng uh, patient, no? I ilalabas yun. <laughs> okay? Ayan. Ayan. So, ayan, let's now go to your compliance or also known as capacitance. So, ano ba yung compliance at capacitance? This is the total quantity of blood that can be stored in a given portion of the circulation for each mmHg pressure rise. Okay, so ilan daw yung dami ng blood na kaya mong i-store doon sa part na yun kapag tumaas yung pressure. Okay, so a, ten a tendency of the blood vessel volume to increase as the BP increases. Tama naman, no? <clears throat> Sige. So, vessels now with a large compliance, so increase compliance, hindi na conductance and a compliance. 
So, ang mangyari daw, uh, besta sa large compliance, exhibit a large increase in volume. So, increase rin yung blood volume, no? O, sige, ano na lang, ganyan natin ba? Ikay malita. So, yan. Even if, kunyari, nag-increase lang daw ng small amount of pressure. Kunyari, uh, nag-increase lang ng 1 mmHg. Tapos nag-increase nga yung ano niya, compliance. No, increase yung blood volume. Kahit hindi ganun sobang, sobrang ka-increase yung um, increase in pressure. So, kapag naman small yung compliance ng vessel mo, meaning hindi ganun mag increase yung blood volume no, kapag nagkaroon ng change in pressure. So, ayan. We know that yung vein, veins compliance is greater than arterial compliance. Again, that is because yung veins natin are reservoir. Okay? So, here naman daw, yung venous compliance is 24 times greater than arterial compliance. Diba kanina, 8 times lang. So, ngayon naman, sa compliance, 24 times siya. So, kapag nag-increase ang pressure ng venous uh, natin, ng veins natin, we know that the volume will also increase. Okay? So, yun lang. Next na tayo, guys. So, this is a table lang showing yung ano natin. Uh, yung distribution of blood volume. Gano'ng karaming blood volume sa ating blood vessels. Okay? Your compliance. So, yan. Kitang-kita naman sa veins has 64%. So, towards 64% of the blood. Again, they have higher compliance. So, let's differentiate naman yung uh, dispensability versus compliance. So, here naman, a highly dispensable vessel, di ba, um, has, a vol has a small volume, may have far less compliance than a much less dispensable vessel that has a large volume. Because um, compliance is equals to dispensability. So, compliance is equals to dispensability times of volume. So, yeah. So, di ba, again, yung dispensability natin, ayan, dispensability natin is yung elastic properties no ating arterial wall, no? Yung compliance naman is the total quantity of blood that can be stored kapag um, nagkaroon ng increase in pressure rise in a uh, certain portion of circulation. Okay, so it just means na um, highly distensible vessel that has a small volume that has a small volume may have far less compliance. Yeah, so it just means that, for example, malaki talaga yung this Ay, no, wala. Malaki talaga yung distensibility ko o oh, nung vessel na yon Pero small yung volume niya. Okay? So, meaning, decrease pa rin yung compliance niya kasi ito yung formula. Okay? And, yung less distensible vessel naman, for example, ito yung less distensible vessel. Tapos, eh, malaki yung volume niya. Okay? Malaki yung volume niya. So, meaning, pwede increase yung kanyang compliance. Dahil dyan. Kasi two factors yun nga yung nag- uh, determine ng compliance natin, no? Blood volume. So, tignan mo yung volume, hindi lang yung diameter. So, yun. Ayan. So, let's now go to the exchange of water, nutrients, and other substances between the blood and interstitial fluid. So, ito yung ating uh, capillary, no? Capillary yan. Tapos, yan. Diffusion of fluid molecules dissolve substances between the capillary and interstitial fluid. So, mm, again, we have your lipid soluble substances, meaning they are soluble to lipid, <laughs> in fact. Pero yung water soluble, they are not soluble sa lipid. Lipid. So they diffuse into pores. Okay? So directly, it just means na directly sila mag uh, di diffuse. Kasi lipid soluble naman sila. Makakadaan sila doon sa membrane, di ba? Lipid membrane. Mm. So those are some examples. Yung ano, oxygen saka carbon dioxide. Kasi ba they are very important. So, you don't need any more ng mga pores or clips. Ganyan. Okay? And also, yung rate, yung rate ng pag-ano nila ha, ng pag-exchange or transport nila is also increased. Fast talaga. Then your um, uh, water-soluble substances like your sodium, ions, and glucose, chloride, water. No, So, this naman, these substances naman, they has to go to your pores or intracellular clefts. So, uh, just uh, take note, no, yung velocity between doon sa, sa cleft, yung velocity ng thermal molecular motion, meaning yung paggalaw ng mga molecules doon, sobrang taas siya. No? It's very su sufficient to allow na ano, yung tremendous diffusion of water and water-soluble substances through this cleft pore. So, that's also what aids na magkaroon ng transport. Okay? So, let's go next. So, this is just the table. The table 16 this is the weight okay, of the substance, as you can see, and the permeability. So, 
why is it there? So number three, it says that the molecular size and weight influences permeability. Okay, so <clears throat> ayan, yung usual kasi na width ng um, cleft or 6 to 7 nanometers, no? It is 20 times the diameter of the water molecule, no? So, meaning sobrang malaki yung mga clefts na yan. So, yung uh, water molecule, siya yung, um, siya yung smallest molecule, okay? Siya yung smallest molecule, as you can see, 18 lang yung weight niya, no? Na nagpa-pass through your capillary pores. So, 20 times ng laki niya, yung ating, again, yung cleft or pores natin. So, although uh, the capillaries in various tissues, they have extreme differences in their permeability. So, for instance, the membranes ng liver capillary sinusoids are so permeable, no? Malaki yung ano niya, yung kanyang pores niya. Or more permeable siya, na kahit yung plasma proteins, nagpapash siya through these walls, no? Like your water and other substances. So, yun, iba-iba rin yung characteristics ng capillaries. Let's go now to the concentration difference or on net rate of diffusion. So it just means na if the if there is greater difference between the concentration of any given substance on the two sides, na dun sa capillary membrane, no, may, may mas increase na part or na substance, the greater the net movement of the substance in one direction through the membrane. So for example, the concentration of oxygen dun sa capillaries, di ba sa blood, it is carried by red, red blood cells, it is normally greater than doon sa tissues, no, sa interstitial fluid. No? Therefore, large quantities ng oxygen will normally move from the blood towards the tissues. Okay? And now, yung, yung carbon dioxide naman, since it's uh, numerous doon sa tissues, it will go naman to your capillaries. Okay? So, the rates of diffusion through the capillary mem membranes of most nutritionally important substances are so great. So, yun nga sinabi natin kanina, diba? sobrang mabilis yung diffusion nila. Na kahit konti lang yung concentration difference nila. No? it is sufficient para magkaroon ng transport. Parang hindi niya nakahintay na sobrang laki ng difference para ma-transport. Okay? So, it's very important even in uh, normal conditions. Okay? So, these are the forces ng ating ano, capillary and interstitial fluid exchange. Yung ating starting forces. So, they determine yung, um, yung exchange. Okay? So, we have your capillary pressure. As you can see here, this is your PC. So, siya yung nasa loob. So, what it does is it tends to force the fluid outward. No, through the capillary membrane. So, gusto niya pumunta sa interstitial fluid. On the other hand, yung interstitial fluid pressure naman, or PIF, ang gusto naman niya, i-force yung fluid inward. No? Parang nagbabanggaan sila. So, when PIF is positive, ayan, gusto niya i- um, ipapunta inward. So, pag positive. Kapag, in, kapag negative naman siya, gusto niya ipa-outward. Okay. Next one is your capillary plasma colloid or osmotic. Ay, CPCOP ang maha, medyo mahaba siya, no? Mm, capillary plasma colloid osmotic pressure. O pico. Yan, or yung ano natin. So, ang ginagawa naman yan, guys, is it causes osmosis of fluid inward. So, gusto niya inward. So, yan, may arrow naman na inward. Next one, ibig sabihin, so, sobrang marami yung osmo, osmotic uh, pressure niya. Marami kang ano, substance or solute dyan. Ganon din kapag ano, interstitial fluid. Colloid, osmotic pressure. Marami siyang colloids or substances inside. So, gusto niya i-move outward yung fluid. No? Hinahatak niya. So, yung sum of those dito, yung total niyan is your NFP or net filtration pressure. No? <clears throat> if positive daw yan, there will be a net fluid filtration across the capillaries. No? Kapag naging positive yung sum netong lahat ng ito, no? there will be a fluid filtration. FF na lang. Fluid. Pero kapag negative naman yung sum ng starling forces, alam mo naman na yung fluid ay hindi ma-filter but fluid absorption naman. Okay. Fluid absorption, saan? From your tissue papunta sa capillary. Okay. So, papunta sa capillary. So, ito kapag negative. Fluid absorption. Kapag naman positive, again, fluid filtration. Okay. So, yun lang siya. Yan. Ito rin yun. Net filtration pressure kapag positive. Again, fluid filtration. So, um, fluid filtration across the capillaries. <clears throat> so, kapag, ano yan, kapag, kapag positive, no, fluid filtration. Kapag positive yung end. So, yan. <clears throat> From the interstitial from the capillaries 
Okay, into the into the situation. So, gusto mo ma-field. Yung isa naman is negative, so fluid absorption, no? So, yan. From the interstitial spaces into the capillaries. Okay? So, we have the rate of fluid filtration. Na yung, diba, yung kanina, FF fluid filtration. Tapos, dinedetermine din siya ni KF or capillary filtration coefficient. So, sino ba si capillary coefficient, filtration, KF na lang. No? So, it is the measure of the capacity ng capillary membranes to filter water for a given um, net filtration pressure. Okay? So, it is determined by the number and size ng pores in each capillary and kung ilan yung capillaries, kung saan nagpo-flow yung blood. No? So, kapag, tandaan mo lang, kapag ka-increase yung ating capillary filtration coefficient or KF, increase rin si net filtration natin. Okay? So, ganun din, vice versa lang. Okay, so yan lang yun guys. Let's go now to the local control of blood flow. So we have local control of blood flow. We have acute muna and then long term. Okay? So it is a fundamental principle kasi ng ano natin, circulatory system kasi they, uh, most tissues, they have the ability to control yung own local blood flow nila. Okay? In relation sa specific metabolic needs. <clears throat> okay, so let's go first. Doon sa two phases, yung acute phase muna, acute control. So, what happens here, uh, it is achieved by rapid yan, by rapid changes in local vasodilation or vasoconstriction, okay? Of the arterioles, metarterioles, precapillary sphincters that occur within seconds to minutes, okay? To provide very rapid maintenance of appropriate local tissue blood flow. So, kailangan siya agad-agad, no? Kaya acute, no? Seconds to minutes lang, Okay? Yung long term naman, meaning, kaya nga long term na pang matagalan. So, mabagal yan. Matagal, tapos control yung changes niya. Over a period of days, even weeks or even months pa nga. So, in general, itong long term control daw, mas better yung control of the flow niya. Okay? In proportion to the needs of the tissue. So, these changes come about as a result of an increase or decrease in physical sizes and numbers of blood uh, vessels. So, dito naman, guys, hindi na siya vaso, dito kasi diba vaso dilate, vaso constrict. Dito kay long-term control, ang ano ni dyan, ang inclusion na dyan is, or changes happening is, uh, yung yung sizes talaga ng blood vessels, tsaka yung dami. Okay? Number. Number and sizes. Na nagsusupply dun sa tissue. So, kailangan ko bang bilisan, ay bilisan damihan. Okay? Kailangan ba mas malalaki yung sizes ng ano natin, blood vessel? Ganun. So, here, uh, let's dive more into acute control of local blood flow. So, increases in tissue metabolism, increases tissue blood flow. Siyempre, kapag may nangangailangan, no, may, nag, may nagagamit, so kailangan, tagdagan mo pa yung ano, supply doon sa part na yun. Okay? So, eto guys, uh, reduced oxygen availability, increased tissue blood flow. So, for example, di ba, umakyat ka ng mountain, nag-climb ka, uh, mount pulag ka, <laughs> or for example, may pneumonia ka, or uh, na-poison na ka ng carbon monoxide okay, tsaka cyanide. No? So, yung carbon dioxide kasi nadidecrease na yung ability ng hemoglobin to transport oxygen. So, yun yung ano niya, yun yung pangit na ginagawa niya, no? On the other hand, yung cyanide naman, dinidecrease na yung ability ng, or pinupta, pinupoison, niya yung tissue to use oxygen. So, kahit maraming oxygen, pero yung tissue hindi nagagamit yung oxygen, no? Dahil, ayun nga, dahil sa cyanide poisoning. So, yan yung nangyayari. Reduce yung oxygen availability. So, magkakaroon ka ng increase na blood flow. So, we have your vasodilatory theories. Ano ba yung vasodilatory theory? So, it just means that the greater the rate of metabolism, ayun na nga yung sinabi natin, or either yan na, either increase yung tissue metabolism or reduce yung oxygen availability. So, parang 1 and 2. Okay? So, meaning there will be a a greater rate of formation ng mga vasodilator substances. So, ibig sabihin, uh, there will be um, more vasodilator substances that will be formed dapat. No? Para nga maaning demand of oxy increasing oxygen. So, yung vasodilator substances are your uh, adenosine, carbon dioxide, your adon adenosine phosphate compounds, histamine, potassium ions, and hydrogen ions. Okay, so they are believed to diffuse through the tissues so sa precapillary sphincters, the metatarials and arterioles to cause dilation. So yun yung ginagawa niya, no? yung mga vasodilator substances that I've mentioned. Ano naman yung oxygen demand, Curie, guys? So ito naman, 
uh, also known as your nutrient demand theory. No, kasi kasama rin other nutrients aside from your oxygen. So meaning in the absence daw ng adequate oxygen, yan, konti yung ano, oxygen, syempre, dapat yung blood vessels mo, they will relax and dilate, no, to have more blood flow. Okay, so, um, increased metabolism, theoretically, could decrease the ability of oxygen. So, that's why ito, parang mag, ano sila, um, magkakonek yung dalawang yan. So, yan. Those are the things that will cause your vasodilation. And later, mag-discuss pa tayo ng other um, things, or other substances that will um, vasodilate. Okay, so these are other factors lang that can cause local tissue vasodilation. So, yeah, uh, lack of glucose, no? Wala ka rin no other nutrients, amino acid, fatty acid, dun sa blood. Also, you have deficiency in vitamin B, okay? Thiamine, niacin, riboflavin. So, they will all cause um, vasodilation. Kasi they are needed daw for your oxygen-induced phosphorylation. So, it is required to produce ATP in the tissue cells, no? So, again, these vitamins are needed in your oxygen-induced uh, phosphorylation. And then, it's, it is required in um, making or production of your ATP. So, these are really important vitamins. Okay? And other factors as well is your active hyperemia. Okay? So, for example, hyperemia, um, you are exercising, kunyari, yung ano mo, uh, biceps, mag-exercise ka ng biceps. Mm. Uh, like, for example, ren yung ano, GI gland during a hypersecretory period or yung brain mo kapag, kunyari, nag-aaral ka, kunyari, kapag when you are studying, diba? So, uh, those are the stimulus na ng active hyperemia siya. So, meaning, there will be increase in local metabolism. So, mangyari yung cells, they will devour the tissue fluid nutrients rapidly kasi nga ginagamit mo na merong increase, um, a metabolism. So, that will also release large quantities of vasodilator substances. So, if the blood vessels are vasodilated, you know that there will be increased blood flow. So, your local blood flow, so that the part or area will receive more nutrients, okay? <clears throat> On the other hand, the reactive hyperemia naman, okay, when the blood supply to a tissue is blocked, for example, a few seconds, hanggang an hour or more, tapos in-unblock mo siya, so blood flow through the tissue usually increases immediately. Siyempre, naka-unblock and then, ay, naka-block din, in-unblock. So, mag-increase siya like 4 to 7 times to normal. So, itong increased flow na daw to, it will continue for a few seconds if the block has lasted only a few seconds. Pero kapag uh, daw longer siya, kapag uh, yung blockage then is of course longer. Kunyari, one hour mo in yung blockage, okay? So, that is your reactive hyperemia. So, lack of flow sets into motion all of the factors that causes vasodilation. So, if anything na mayroong lack of flow, no, yun siya yung magiging cause to vasodilate. Okay, let's go now to the long-term blood flow regulation. So, here guys, as you can see, yung metabolism daw in a tissue is increased for a prolonged period, like a uh, period of hours, days, and weeks. So, long-term type ng local blood flow regulation develops in addition siya dun sa kanina, sa acute control. So, it gives more uh, complete control ng blood flow. Yeah, so if the tissue becomes chronically overactive, so matagal na, no, overactive na siya, and therefore re requires increased quantities of oxygen and other nutrients, yung arterioles and capillary vessels, usually they increase nga both in number and size. So, parang may physical reconstruction dun sa issues, no? And also, meron din mga formation ng new blood vessels like yung uh, angiogenesis natin, no? Yan. So, for example, nga, yung arterial pressure daw, it remains at 150 mmHg. So, within a few weeks, the blood flow um, through the tissue gradually approaches almost exactly the normal flow level. So, parang inihabulin niya yung 150 mo. No? Due to the long-term blood flow regulation. So, once it occurs, yung long-term regulation, long-term changes na yung mangyayari. So, between 50 and 250 m mHg, yung changes. No? They will have little effect on the rate of local blood flow. So, ayan. So, for example, ito yung, I don't know, ano bang hype siya. So, yeah. So, for example, yung, ayan, yung mammal na yan, they have increased uh, vascularity in tissues kasi nga nasa high altitude sila. So, prolonged period na. So, we know that yung atmospheric oxygen is low. No? Low oxygen level sa environment. Kaya, magkakaroon siya ng more blood vessels. No? Called your angiogenesis. 
to compensate of course okay so yeah now we are we we are discussing naman yung endothelial derived control of tissue blood flow so this time naman guys um ano ba endothelial? Diba endothelium? Yan yung uh, vessel ng blood or wall ng blood vessel natin. So, ano ba yung meron doon? Mm. So, we have your nitric oxide. So, nitric oxide is endothelial derived relaxing factor siya. So, ang mangyayari guys is yung yan, shear stress on the endothelial cells there will be viscous drag of the blood against the vascular walls. Okay? Mm. So, mas stress mo yung wall. Okay? And then, ang mangyayari makukontort mo yung endothelial cells in the direction of flow. Okay, so when that happens, the stress contorts the endothelial cells in the direction of flow. There will be increase in nitric oxide, and then the nitric oxide will now um, relax the blood vessels. Okay, so some clinicians they use nitroglycerin, amyl nitrates, and other nitrate derivatives to treat patients who had angina pectoris. So angina pectoris, so it's a severe chest pain caused by ischemia of the heart muscle. So meaning. Uh, your heart muscle is not receiving enough blood supply. So these drugs, when they are broken chemically, they will release nitric oxide. And thus, they will evoke dilation of the blood vessels throughout the body, including also your coronary vessels. So you will have more um, blood supply to the ischemic part. So, so that's to treat your angina pectoris. Okay? Okay, we also have your endothelin. So endothelin, on the other hand, is a vasoconstrictor, okay? This is present in the endothelial cells of all or most blood vessels, but they are greatly increased when the, when the blood vessels are injured. So again, the stimulus will be damaged to the endothelium. So what happens will be there will be release of local endothelin. Bakit? Para saan, ma'am? So, yeah, it's because it helps to prevent extensive bleeding from the arteries, no? And also, though, um, Increased endothelin release is also believed to contribute to vasoconstriction when the endothelium is damaged by hypertension. Okay. So, ang nangyayari, guys, um, yun nga, magkakaroon ng damage sa endothelium. That's why um, there will be increase in uh, endothelin, no? Pero ang gagawin ng ibang drugs is to block yung endothelin receptors, no? So, that to treat pulmonary hypertension. Kung baga, ayaw niya magpasoconstrict yung uh, blood vessels sa ating lungs. Okay. But generally, they have not been used for lowering blood pressure in patients with uh, systemic arterial hypertension. So, nor on pulmonary hypertension lang ginagamit yung endothelin na drug. Or endothelin uh, blocker. Okay. So, here. Pulmonary hypertension is usually treated with drugs that block endothelin. So, yan nga. Why? Why? Because mm, during hypertension, there is increase in pressure in the arteries. So, yung blood vessel, yung ating blood, blood vessel wall or endothelium will be damaged. Therefore, there, therefore, therefore, resulting in increased release of endothelium. Kasi nga na-damage, so mag-endothelium ka. So, magkakaroon na naman ng vasoconstriction. Eh, ang cause nga is blood pressure, di ba? So, that's why you have to give patients na, the drugs that will block yung endothelium to decrease the uh, vasoconstriction. Thus, decreasing blood pressure as well. Okay, so we also have your um, humoral control. So meaning, these are the hormones that control the blood flow. We have your angiotensin 2, uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine. Um, okay, also your vasopressin. Okay, okay, let's just show them all. Okay, for your norepinephrine and epinephrine, again, if the sympathetic nervous system is activated, the, specifically adrenal medulla, you know, uh, during emergency situations, then your NE and FE will be released. So they function as vasoconstrictors. On the other hand, your angiotensin 2, they act on the CNS, right, to increase vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone. So antidiuretic hormone, they don't want you to produce urine. So it is, it happens in the hypothalamus and then it will stimulate the posterior pituitary to secrete ADH to the bloodstream and Again, functions as vasoconstrictor. Ay. Okay, so another uh, vasodilator hormone is your bradykinin. So, uh, this is cool because your bradykinin, okay, let's show them. So, the calicrine is a prote proteolytic enzyme, okay, that is present 
in tissue and blood in its inactive form. So first it's inactive and then if there is maceration, for example, inflammation of the tissue, anything that has a uh, chemical or physical effects on your blood or tissue, it will activate your calicrine. Okay, so as it is activated na, it acts immediately dito sa uh, to alpha to globulin to release naman yung calidin. So si calidin naman is kinoconvert siya ng tissue natin. Tissue enzymes to bradykinin. So, okay, bradykinin is the major, again, vasodilator, no? Vasodilator siya. And its effect is mostly on your bitter receptors. Okay, so another vasodilators is your histamine. So histamine, as you can see, tissues become damaged or inflamed. So, or uh, patient is allergy, no? So they will release your histamine. So like your badikinin, again, it increases the capillary porosity, allowing leakage of both fluid and plasma protein into the tissues. So just a summary, guys. Vasoconstrictors here, vasodilator here, endothelial derived, and humoral control. Okay, this one as well. Vasoconstrictor and vasodilator, ions and chemicals. Okay, so let's go now to your map. So map and its reflex maintenance. So blood flow to all areas of the body depends on the uh, maintenance of adequate pressure in the arteries. Tama naman, no? So as long as uh, the arterial blood pressure is adequate, we know that there is a local control of blood flow, right? Dun sa um, needs, no? Based on needs ng uh, tissues natin. So we know that the blood flow through tissues cannot be adequate if the arterial blood pressure is low. So what will happen if it's too low na, no? And you cannot maintain na yung normal blood pressure, so you will uh, have a circulatory shock, okay? So your map naman is slightly less than the average of systolic and diastolic pressures because your diastole lasts longer than systole. So the formula for your map is your cardiac output times peripheral resistance. So cardiac output again is equal to your to your HR and SV, heart rate and stroke volume. Okay. So as an indicated, blood pressure is influenced influenced by three factors. Okay, your heart rate at these three. Okay, your heart rate, stroke volume, and peripheral resistance. So peripheral resistance. So any increase in one of these um, elements. Okay, will elevate your blood pressure. Okay, if some, if anyone also decreases, of course, uh, your BP will be reduced. Okay, blood pressure, heart rate, stroke volume, and PR. Okay, let's go now to your blood pressure regulation. So we have your short trip. So we'll be discussing all this. Your barrier sector reflexes. Okay, until your CNS system's ischemic response. So these are short term. No, they are rapidly acting mechanisms controlling the blood pressure. Rapid, so it's like the acute, no? Mobilisan. So some of the reflexes, they operate on a minute-to-minute -minute basis and help uh, regulate blood pressure within a narrow range of values. So other mechanisms naman during emergency situations. So first, this let's first discuss yung baroreceptor reflexes. So these reflexes, they are important in regulating blood pressure on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Now, for example, you stand up from sitting or you lie down from standing position. So they will detect even the small changes in blood pressure and they will respond quickly, but they are not as important in regulating the blood pressure over long periods of time. So again, rapid and short lang. No? So how does it happen? So we have your baroreceptors, as you can see here, your, in your carotid sinus and then aortic arc, okay? At the base of the internal carotid artery and the walls of the aortic arc. So action potentials will travel from the carotid sinus at the base of, again, internal ICA, okay? Through your cranial nerve 9 or glossopharyngeal nerve 9, okay? To the cardioregulatory and vasomotor centers in the medulla oblongata, okay? On the other hand, okay, from the aortic arc, it will now, the action potentials will travel to the cranial nerve 10, okay, to the medulla oblongata as well. So, if the carotid sinus is the one that is stimulated, okay, or the baroreceptors here, the reflex is called carotid sinus reflex, and then here is the aortic arc reflex, okay? So, both, both of them are... Um, Baroreceptor reflexes. Okay, so they help they help keep the blood pressure in homeostasis. So again, we know that the baroreceptors are partially stretched. Okay, 
uh, the normal blood pressure partially stretch the arterial wall. Okay, here the arterial wall, here arteries, they are partially stretched. That's why your baron's receptors, they produce a constant low frequency action potentials. Okay, low frequency action potential. So increased pressure, diba, high BP ka na, yung ating uh, vessel walls, they will be stretched. So kapag they, will, they are stretched, the frequency of action potentials will be increased. Okay? So yan, they will send it to the vasomotor centers. And then, of course, there will be decreased sympathetic, increased parasympathetic. Uh, number four, okay, this one, increased sympathetic. Okay, if there is decreased BP, on the other hand, so that's what will happen. The uh, action potential will be decreased again. And then there will be increased sympathetic stimulation and decreased parasympathetic. Okay, so just review this diagram. I already said what will happen if there is increased blood pressure and also um, here if there is decreased blood pressure. So um, know that if, again, the heart rate and stroke volume increases, constriction of blood vessel, increase of your peripheral resistance, it will all boil down to increased blood pressure. Okay, so let's go now to the adrenal medullary mechanism. So what happened here? So it is activated by a substantial increase in sympathetic stimulation okay, of your heart and blood vessels. So meaning, the stimulus that will be uh, detected is large decreases in your blood pressure, okay, or sudden and substantial increase in physical activity and other stressful conditions. So any sympathetic stimulation, okay? So, the adrenal medullary mechanism results from stimulation ng adrenal medulla by the sympathetic nerve fibers. As you can see here, the nerve fiber will, um, will stimulate okay, the adrenal medulla right, to release epinephrine and small amount of norepinephrine, FE and nore, into the bloodstream. So, these hormones will now affect the cardiovascular systems, right? And just review the result or the responses when we have an activated sympathetic nervous system. So increased heart rate, increased stroke volume, vasoconstriction to, of course, increase the blood pressure or keep up during demands of exercise and emergency situations. Again, this uh, mechanism is short-term and rapid acting. So it responds to within seconds and minutes and then just, you know, uh, until uh, minutes to hours, okay? Let's go next to your chemoreceptor reflexes. So chemoreceptor reflexes is just like your baroreceptor reflexes. Okay, but here, um, what you'll be, um, the stimulus will be the decrease in blood oxygen, okay, or increase in your carbon dioxide in the blood or decrease in pH, okay? So we have your chemoreceptors in your carotid body and aortic body. Okay, so they are like one, one to two millimeters in diameter, so very small, and they lie on near the carotid sinus, okay, and aortic bodies just adjacent to the aorta. So the affer afferent nerve fibers, we know that they pass, okay, to the medulla oblongata through your cranial nerve 9 and 10 again. So again, 9 for your carotid body and then 10 to your aortic body to the, again, medulla oblongata. Okay. So know that these chemoreceptors, they receive an abundant blood supply. That's why if the oxygen level decreases in the chemoreceptor cells, okay, the, that's the time that the frequency of action potentials increases as well. So it will stimulate your vasomotor center. So if, that's, uh, if there's a stimulation in vasomotor center, we know that there is an increase in vasomotor tone. Okay, so this, um, this reflexes acts during emergency situation and not under resting condition, okay? So they normally do not respond strongly unless your blood oxygen decreases markedly, okay? And also increase blood pressure, decrease pH, okay? So if the vasomotor tone is increased, we know that your MAP, okay, will also rise, okay? The mean arterial pressure will rise because it's, again, increase in stroke volume, heart rate, etc. Because, of course, there is also constriction of blood vessels. So that's the reflex. Um, this reflex, guys, it helps provide adequate oxygen to the brain and the heart. 
Okay, when the blood oxygen levels in those areas decreases. Kasi, uh, yung blood vessels natin, hindi siya nagkoconstrict doon sa brain at cardiac muscle natin. Okay? So, yun yung uh, mangyayari. Increase in vasomotor tone. And, of course, increase in map. Okay, so let's uh, discuss that in the next slides. So, here we can see that the blood pH increases. So, it will be detected by your chemoreceptors, again, in your aortic um, bodies and carotid bodies. So, if there is already um, increase in blood pH, because there is a decrease in uh, blood carbon dioxide, it will inhibit your vasomotor and cardioregulatory center. Okay, if they are inhibited, meaning there is decreased vasomotor tone, so the blood vessels will uh, vasodilate, peripheral resistance will decrease, heart rate, stroke volume decrease, reduce blood flow to the lungs. Okay, so you don't want, you want to increase the blood carbon dioxide to increase or to decrease your blood pH. Okay, so that's when you restore already the homeostasis. So let's see the opposite uh, part naman. Blood pH decreases meaning there are more carbon dioxide in the blood. So again, they will be detected by your chemoreceptors. Okay, in the medulla and in the carotid and aortic bodies. So they will stimulate naman. Stimulate the vasomotor and cardioregulatory center. So, effect niya, increase vasomotor tone. So, vasoconstriction, increase peripheral resistance, heart, heart rate, stroke volume, increase blood flow to the lungs to expel your carbon dioxide so that you will have a increased pH. Okay? So, let's go now to your CNS ischemic response naman. So, here, um, emergency pressure control system that acts rapidly and powerfully to prevent further decrease in arterial pressure whenever blood flow to the brain decrease, decreases dangerously close to the lethal level. And so what happens is, um, yung pinaka-GS niya lang naman is to, <clears throat> is to elevate the blood pressure in response to lack of blood flow to the medulla oblongata of the brain. So yun nga, kapag konting blood pressure mo sa MO, so that this response will be activated. So, it does not, again, play an important role sa during normal condition. Again, response ito during emergency situation, no? Kunyari, sobrang decrease na yung blood flow mo sa brain or yung BP mo nag less than 60 na, less than 50 mmHg na, 60 or 50, no? As you can see here. So, yan yung map niya. So, reduce blood flow to the metal oblongata, of course. Ayun nga, stimulate natin yung ating vasomotor center, increase vasomotor tone. So, vasoconstriction to increase BP and increase blood flow, syempre, sa ating brain. Kasi kailangan, kailangan niya na ng oxygen. Okay? So, yun, yun lang naman siya. So, ito. Ito, guys. So, mangyayari siya given na kung may, ano na, may intact pa yung blood vessels mo. Kasi, diba, it's sobrang haba na or tagal na nung ischemia. Longer than few minutes na siya. Yung metabolism sa brain natin magfe-fail na siya dahil sa lack of oxygen. So, magiging inactive na yung vasomotor center natin. And there will be extensive vasodilation. So, hindi na ito mangyayari, guys. Okay? So, vasomotor tone will decrease. So, magkakaroon na ng prolonged ischemia. Okay? Prolonged ischemia, meaning dead cell, dead na siya dahil walang uh, oxygen. Decrease blood pressure. So, ultimately, yung patient natin is mamamatay na siya. Okay? That's why talaga emergency, ano to, emergency um, situation siya. So, rapidly and powerful yung, ano niya, yung response na to. Okay? So, let's go to the Cushing reaction. This one naman, guys, special type lang siya no kanina, yung CNS ischemic response. So, it results from increased pressure ng CSF around the brain in the cranial vault. So, what happens, guys, is may increased pressure nga ng CSF. So, mas higher siya dun sa arterial pressure. Tapos, nakakompress niya yung brain and blood vessels. So, wala nang nagsusupply sa brain natin. So, magkakaroon ng CNS ischemic response. So, ang mangyari, um, i-increase na yung arterial pressure higher than the CSF. Okay? So, para magkaroon ng uh, more blood flow to the brain and then again, ma-relieve yung brain ischemia natin. So, again, ang may increase natin dyan is yung arterial pressure. Hmm? So, ayan, yun na yung ano niya, new equilibrium niya, no? Increase na yung BP niya. 
So, uh, the Cushing discussion reaction, it helps protect vital centers of the brain from loss of nutrition. If the CSF fluid or CSF pressure ever rises high enough to compress the cerebral arteries. So, yun yung ano natin, panlaban natin sa increase in CSF pressure. Okay, so we have uh, also your long-term regulation of your blood pressure. So we will be discussing the three lang. Okay, so this long-term regulatory mechanism, they respond in minutes, but they continue to function for hours, days, or longer. Okay, so they adjust the blood pressure precisely. Okay, and keep it within a narrow range of values for years. So matagal yung effect niya. Itong matagalan na ito. Okay, so we have your renin, angiotensin, aldosterone mechanism. So here, as you can see, if there is decrease in arterial pressure, yung renin natin is magpoproduce siya ng kid. Yung kid din natin magpoproduce siya ng renin. Okay. So ang pinaka main, ano nito, um, main effect nito is, um, yung kid din natin kasi mag increase siya ng urine output. Right. Kapag yung blood volume, tsaka yung BP mataas. Okay. Tapos i-decrease naman yung urine output oppositely kapag nag-decrease yung blood volume tsaka yung arterial pressure. So, kapag marami ka nang nilalabas na urine, magde-decrease na yung blood volume mo tsaka blood pressure, right? And kapag nag-decrease naman yung urine output mo, okay, nire-resist niya na yung further decrease in blood volume and blood pressure. Kasi hindi naman siya uh, pwede na puro increase urine ano lang, urine output, no? That's why it's really important yung controlling the urine output to uh, control din yung ating blood pressure or regulate yung blood pressure natin. Okay? So, ito ang ginagawa ni Rin ng Gitesin is ganun siya, no? Ina-alter niya yung blood volume. So, again, ang nire-release na enzyme ni kidney is si renin. Okay? Doon sa ating circulatory system produced by your juxta glomerular apparatuses, no? So, this renin, it will act on a plasma protein, yung ating angiotensinogen na makikita sa liver. No, i-split na yung isang fragment doon sa angiotensinogen. So, yung fragment din is yung angiotensin 1 which, which contains 10 amino acid. Tapos, we also have another enzyme, your ACE, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme. And then, ang gagawin naman niya, guys, is i-ano uh, naman niya. Ikikleave niya yung two additional amino acids naman sa angiotensin 1, making it angiotensin 2 na. So, 8 na lang yung amino acid. So, it's also called your active angiotensin. So, this angiotensin 2 will cause um, vasoconstriction, no? So, arterioles and some degrees of vein. So, as a result, again, increase yung peripheral resistance and venous return to the heart. So, mag increase na yung ating arterial pressure. Not only that, your angiotensin 2, as you can see here, um, it will uh, stimulate your adrenal cortex no, to produce um, aldosterone. So, aldosterone, ano bang ginagawa niya? It acts sa kidneys natin to increase the reabsorption of sodium and chloride. So, ayaw niya palabasin yung sodium and chloride. Okay? So, kapag ka, ano rin, kapag ka present din sa ADH natin, water moves by osmosis with the sodium and chloride natin. So, consequently, aldosterone causes the kidneys to retain the solutes. Diba? Yun nga yung ating uh, sodium and chloride and water. So, magkakaroon ng increased blood volume kasi uh, maraming solute. So, increase yung blood volume, decrease yung urine production, so na-conserve mo yung water. Also, yung angiotensin 2, it also increases yung salt, appetite yung gusto mo ng maala, thirst, and also yung ADH secretion. So, mamaya didiscuss natin si ADH. So, also, decreased blood pressure, di ba, stimulates the renin, angiotensin, uh, aldosterone mechanism. So, again, it's important on a daily basis, guys. Ha? It also reacts then during a circulatory shock, pero kailangan nyo ng many hours to become uh, maximally effective. So, yung onset niya daw is not as fast as that of a nervous reflexes or adrenal medullary response. Pero yung duration niya is longer. Okay? So, kapag na nailabas mo na si renin, it will be uh, remain active for approximately one hour. And then, yung effect niya is much longer. Okay? So, we have your, ano, your drugs called uh, ACE or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. So, they inhibit itong, ano, itong, ito, 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 itong ACE. Okay, so, hindi na ko convert si 1 sa 2. Okay, so, ang mangyayari, guys, is, of course, madidecrease natin yung hypertension. So, yun lang. <clears throat> and also, um, some stimuli then can directly daw stimulate yung aldosterone secretion natin sa adrenal cortex. So, um, example, for example, uh, maraming uh, potassium. And decrease yung sodium. So, it will 
stimulate yung aldosterone. Okay? Na, uh, mm, yun nga, during kapag decrease yung, I mean, increase potassium, decrease sodium. So, aldosterone regulates yung concentration ng Einstein. So, kapag nag-decrease yung blood pressure, tas mataas yung potassium concentration, no, it happens during plasma loss, during dehydration. Okay, kapag may tissue damage kung na-burn ka or kaya mga crushing injuries so that will happen, no, yung aldosterone will be increased. So, more, para, uh, sa, ano, more of that sa endocrine na ba na-discuss na. So, let's go now to your antidiuretic hormone or your vasopressin mechanism. So, uh, what just happened here is, um, it is, the stimulus would be here. Uh, increase yung um, osmotic pressure or osmolality ng blood. Ibig sabihin maraming solute, no? And also, there is a decreased blood pressure. And this one, they work hand in hand with your renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. Ra. Okay, in response to the blood pressure. So, uh, again, yung baroreceptors natin, they are sensitive diba, sa blood pressure mm. changes. So, um, they will res they will uh, they will secrete or they will cause ADH secretion from your posterior pituitary. Okay, so although daw dapat uh, yung blood pressure must decrease substantially before this mechanism is activated. So sobrang dapat decrease BP nga. Um, and then after that, of course, yan magi increase na ng ADH and si ADH will constrict so that you'll have increased blood volume and blood pressure. <clears throat> okay, so although it's not the same as other, it's not so potent vasoconstriction or vasoconstrictors, okay? So, within minutes daw, after a rapid and substantial decline in BP, so minutes, diba, ADH is released in sufficient quantities to help re-establish normal blood pressure. So, also, yung ating ADH, they decrease, no, antidiuretic, they don't want you to produce urine. So, <clears throat> they decrease the rate of urine production by the kidneys to maintain blood volume and pressure. So, there will be reabsorption of water. So, your hypothalamic neuron is sensitive to the changes in the uh, solute uh, so, youth concentration in the plasma. Okay, so kahit daw, small increase lang yung mangyari, nasa stimulate agad sa hypothalamic neurons to increase your ADH secretion so that, ayan na, na magkakaroon ng increased reabsorption of water in the kidneys. So, ADH increases water reabsorption by the kidneys, okay, and also your vasoconstriction. So, ito yung two effects nyo, guys. Yeah, let's go to the last mechanism, yung atrial natriuretic mechanism. So, ano ba yung ANH or atrial natriuretic hormone? So, it's a polypeptide. It is released from the cells in the atria of the heart. So, sa atria siya ng heart, nare-release. So, ang major stimulus dito, guys, is yung increased venous return. So, maraming bumalik na uh, blood in your atria. Okay? So, na-stretch yung atrial cardiac muscle cell mo. So, it will act on your kidney to increase the rate of urine production. Ito naman gusto mo ihin ng ihi. So, maraming loss of water tsaka sodium sa urine. Ang ginagawa niya rin, nagdadilate siya, guys. Nagdadilate ng arteries and veins. So, yung blood pressure natin will decrease kasi na-decrease na yung blood volume nila bas lahat. Okay? So, yun lang siya. Tapos, this one naman, kapag yung blood pressure decreases naman, ang mag-work naman is yung RAA, again, and your ADH. No? Kasi they aim to increase the BP. Yun nga, yung ating renin, ang gitensin, ang gagawin niya is uh, less NA and water loss in the urine, pati si ADH din, vasoconstrictor, okay, and increases your peripheral resistance to, um, again, reach your homeostasis. So, that is all guys thank you for listening guys and these are just some of the references but you can still you know check our student guide for the references and have a good day god bless